Okay, hi kids. How's it going? Uh, good Monday morning. Ooh, this little one's. Oh, <laughs> she's kind of tired. We took her into the vet today, and she got two shots. Um, one of hers was a rabies shot, and they said, you know, you're kind of tired all the time, so. Um, she also got a chest x-ray, and if you think back to our lessons, um, x-rays are radiation, right? But what precautions do you think you need to take? You guys maybe have gotten x-rays before in order to deflect some of that radiation from your body. Um, it's been interesting learning right now a lot more about uranium and the effects here in Moab. Um, we watched a movie on Friday called Dr. Strangelove and had a geologist talk to us about uranium. The half-life, which is the time it takes for a full sample to decrease in it by half by, radi by emitting particles, basically, right? Radiation is um, blasting a part of these molecules into um, isotopes that are more stable because they're unstable to begin with. And the half-life is the same length as our Earth has been around. And what do scientists estimate that as? Maybe you remember? 4.5 billion years. So, brings up a good question, like, what are we going to do with all this radioactive waste? You guys have been doing a great job completing your Smart Sparrow um, Bio Beyond uh, Blue Planet reports. Everything is graded. So I've just graded everything that you've submitted. Um, and I put zeros in to give you the most accurate look at your grade. Um, so that might be an important thing to look at. And as we're closing in on the last couple weeks of the semester, we have a couple more units, a couple more lessons, and then we have the final. Your second DBA needs to be done, um, and the lab report. And so you have three options now for the lab report. The first one is the macromolecules. The second one is the um, osmosis lab with the egg. And the third one is this my body, my experiment. And so on that note of making an experiment with your body, I want you to try out this one for focus. And this comes um, from Liliana. We were working with this because she was like, I can't quite focus. And I've been having the same issue. So um, I just put my phone on airplane mode. I didn't actually even turn it on until 11 o'clock today. And I got a lot of work done. All your stuff graded, which is cool. And then I have it on airplane mode so I don't get like buzzes or notifications. And I'm going to sit here for 25 minutes and we're going to do the lesson. I'm going to see how far we get. And then I'm going to take a 10 minute break. So 25 and 10. And then I'm going to go back at it 25, 10. And I'm actually going to time myself because um, sometimes 10 minutes can turn into 20, can turn into 30, and all of a sudden you haven't got any information. So with all that being said, let's go ahead and start our lesson. Here we are. We're in the Mission Beyond. What is the future of life beyond Earth? We did the headquarters last week. So that was the, these three lessons. And now we want to go into the skeletal lab. And you have to do these three lessons before you unlock the skeletal lab. We're going to start this journey with a lesson called Abnormal Cells. Let's go ahead and begin. Introduction. Doing what's best for the patient. Nearly every person on Earth has a relative, friend, or acquaintance who has battled a form of cancer. About 38% of people will be diagnosed with cancer at some point in their lives. Billions of dollars are spent researching cures and treatments every year. In this lesson, you'll explore pro promising treatments, but using them may not be as straightforward as it seems. The patient's needs must come first. Um, but what does that mean? Here we have lung tissue specimen with cancerous cells. So we'll learn what cancerous cells mean in this lesson. We'll evaluate treatment, communicate ethical implications, and then understand social implications of treatment and research. Um, I think this... Okay, and not to confuse you, I just realized this lesson um, will automatically upload your grade, uh, and it is an auxiliary lesson, but it is still required. It just means it's not going to be in the same order in BioBeyond. From what I can tell. And instead, what you need to do when you go to assignments is you need to load it like I'm doing right now. That's pretty important to know. And then here we'll enter through there. 
Okay, so you won't be able to write a summary for this lesson. All right, okay, welcome to your cohort. Time to join your fellow students on medical rounds. For this lesson, you'll assume the role of a medical student studying internal medicine. Before we start, take a few minutes to reflect on your assumptions about medical profession and answer the questions below. Move the sliders. Do doctors always need patient approval before treatment? And think back to our lesson with uh, my sister and those guidelines for ethical uh, treatment. So what do you think here? Um, are, could there be situations where the patient couldn't give approval? And then what do you think happens? Do ethics, the moral principles, and guiding actions factor into a medical team's decision? Or is there always a best treatment option for every illness or injury? So now we'll meet our attending physician. Dr. Green will be your mentor and teacher while at the hospital. You'll learn by following me in rounds when we'll visit each patient to check on their physical, mental, and emotional state. Then we'll discuss possible diagnoses and treatments. I'm expecting you to share your thoughts and stay on your toes. We've got a lot, a lot of patients to see today. Dr. Green specializes in internal medicine, which cares for adults who have come to the hospital with diseases and other ailments that aren't related to injury. Here's a list of some common ailments that bring patients to our hospital. Which one of these might you expect to see today? Okay, and so select all the ones that are not related um, to traumas, like twisted ankles, fell off the ladder, an arrow to the knee, or being unable to sleep, flu-like simple symptoms, severe headaches, stomach cramps, chest pain, those are all internal medicine, uh, in the realm of internal medicine. All right, our rounds for day one. Here's our first patient, Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Sarah Jones was admitted to the ER with extreme stomach pain, fatigue, nausea, and increased menstrual flow, and severe cramps. Dr. Green mentions that they usually start with an examination. Which area of Mrs. Jones's body should be looked at first? Her abdomen, her brain, her circulatory system, or her legs? She's holding her stomach, so maybe we should take a look at her stomach. Or her abdomen, her stomach region. The stomach, obviously, is just one organ. Okay, developing a diagnosis. After running some initial tests, Dr. Green lets the group know that Mrs. Jones has cancerous cells in her cervix. As you might know, cancer is complex disease that occurs when cells in the body grow uncontrolled. This uncontrolled growth forms tumors, clumps of cells that can cause symptoms all over the body. Between now and tomorrow's rounds, you'll need to work together to get the speed, to get up to speed on the basics of cancer. Tomorrow at rounds, your team will make the initial diagnosis of Mrs. Jones's type of cancer. Um, and so here's the cervix. It's the narrow passageway um, at the base of the uterus in the female reproductive system. Here's a, the eggs are produced here. Those are your ovaries that travel down your fallopian tubes. There's the uterus where the baby would develop. Um, and the cancer is right there. You can see it's an uncontrolled growth. Let's research cancer. You gather with your fellow medical students to review cancer biology. Together you decide who will research what topics. Click on each of your fellow students to see what they found. Also, complete your own part of the review. Okay, so let us, um, maybe we start with you. Okay, gather material to share with the group. You found useful information on the National Institute of Health website, cancer.gov, um, but what materials should you share with the group? Scroll through the excerpt at the right and summarize its key findings below. All right, so I'm gonna read through this and go ahead and take notes on what you think is important, and I'll do the same. Cancer is the name given to a collection of related diseases. In all types of cancer, some of the body's cells begin to divide without stopping and spread into surrounding tissues. Cancer can start almost anywhere in the human body, which is made up of trillions of cells. Normally, human cells grow and divide to form new cancer cells as the body needs them. When cells grow old or become damaged, they die and new cells take their place. When cancer develops, however, this orderly process breaks down. As cells become more and more abnormal, old or damaged cells survive when they should die, and new cells form when they are not needed. These extra cells can divide without stopping, and they form growths called tumors. Cancerous tumors are malignant, which means they can spread into or invade nearby tissues. In addition, as these tumors grow, some cancer cells can break off and travel to distant places in the body, through the blood or the lymph system, and form new tumors far from the original tumor. Unlike malignant tumors, 
benign tumors do not spread into or invade nearby tissues. Cancer cells differ from normal cells in many ways that allow them to grow out of control and become invasive. Okay, that's pretty big. And then I would write down malignant and benign. One important difference is that normal cells mature into very distinct cell types, but cancer cells do not. This is one reason that, unlike normal cells, cancer cells continue to divide without stopping. They also ignore signals that normally tell cells to stop dividing or that begin a process uh, known as programmed cell death or apoptosis. Another good word to write down. Cancer cells may be able to influence the normal cells, molecules, and blood vessels that surround and feed a tumor, an area known as the microenvironment. Some cancer cells are able to hide from the immune system. Okay, so let's go ahead and take notes on that. Okay, um, just pause the recording and go ahead and type that in. Um, when you present this to your study group, they will want a summary for their own notes. How will you condense what you've written above? Okay, select the lines to add to your notes. Normal cells keep dividing, but cancerous cells die off rapidly and harm the body. Cancer is a group of diseases where cells multiply without control and spread. Sounds about right. Um, normal cells grow and die, but cancer cells keep d dividing. True. Um, cancer cells are very specialized in like normal cells, which is how they hide. Also true. Cancer cells aren't specialized. They can hide, ignore cells, and influence normal cells. Cancer is a specific disease regularly found in the chest area. Um, it can be found all over the body. Oh, I had a feeling. So I think this is the better answer. They aren't specialized, but they can hide, ignore cell signals, and influence normal cells. Um, and that's what they said. Uh, let's find it. Here we go. Mature... Normal cells mature into very distinct cell types, but cancer cells do not. So they, that's why they continue to, to divide. Okay, now let's learn from Sasha. How cancer develops. It's a genetic disease. That is, it is caused by changes to genes that control the way our cells function. Genetic changes that cause cancer can be inherited from our parents. Mutations can also arise during a person's lifetime as a result of errors that occur as cells divide or, or because of damaged DNA caused by exposure to carcinogens or cancer-causing chem chemicals, like tobacco smoke or damaging radiation like solar UV rays. Proto-oncogenes. Um, so there's three different types of, of genes. Proto-oncogenes start, manage, and stop cell growth tumor suppressor genes, which slow or prevent uncontrolled cell growth, or DNA repair genes, which repair damaged DNA. So if you have an effect to any three of those, imagine you might start to get um, some cancer forming. Together, a mutation in those genes can cause the cells to become more cancerous. What should you add to your notes to the right? Cancer cells come from specific genetic changes, Proto-oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes repair DNA and prevent cancer. Um, that's DNA repair genes that does that. Chemicals and radiation can damage genes, but genetic changes can be inherited. That sounds about right. All chemicals call ca cause cancer. Not true. Cancer is a contagious disease passed on from family member to family member. It's not contagious, but it can be passed down from a family member through genetics. All right, what's Michael got to say? There's different types of cancers, more than 100. Types of cancer is usually named for the organ or tissues where the cancer is formed, like lung cancer or brain cancer. Here are some categories of cancer that begin in specific types of cells. Carcinomas are the most common types of cancer. They are formed by epithelial cells, which are the cells that cover the inside and outside surfaces of the body. Sarcomas are cancers found in bone and soft tissue, such as fat and muscle. Melanoma is a cancer that begins in cells that um, become melanocytes, which are specialized cells that make melanin. Leukemia leukemias are cancers that begin in the blood-forming tissue of the bone marrow. These cancers are, do not form solid tumors. Instead, large groups of abnormal white blood cells build up in the blood and bone marrow. 
What should you add to your notes? Um, that seems right. More than 100 different types of cancers exist, and many are named after the area affected. There are four types of cancers, carcinomas, sarcomas, melanomas, and leukemia. That seems to sum up what they just told us. Um, maybe this is a better one, though. Are they, They're just some types of cancers. Um, some cancers form tumors, others spread through the blood, like leukemia. All cancers form masses called tumors. Not true, like leukemia doesn't. Okay, there are four types. Oh wait, how did that get unchecked? Okay, these are the three you should select. All right, and Kim, what does Kim have to say about different types of treatments? So, um, some people will get a combination. Here are some treatments. Surgery, when a surgery, surgeon removes cancer from the body. Radiation therapy uses high doses of radiation to kill cancer cells and shrink tumors. Chemotherapy uses drugs to kill cancer cells. Hormone therapy slows or stops the growth of breast and prostate cancers that use hormones to grow. Stem cell transplants restore blood-forming stem cells in cancer patients who have had theirs destroyed by very high doses of chemotherapy or radiation therapy and precision medicines are more likely to help patients based on a genetic understanding of their disease. Precision medicine, I took a whole course on this actually. This is like specifically looking at the genetics of a patient and um, being able to target that using gene therapy. So going in um, and changing your changing your genes. Which should you add to your notes? The regular treatment of cancer is chemotherapy followed by radiation. I don't think there's any regular, um, but each type of cancer has a specific treatment, and they're chosen based on the type and advancement. Those are some of the examples. And chemotherapy uses chemicals, not radiation. Okay, I guess we're not choosing each type of cancer as a specific treatment. Um, because some people with cancer will only have one treatment in a combination. So I guess they're just, each type of cancer can be um, attacked in a variety of different ways. All right. So I think we got them all. Okay, and um, I believe the next slide here should be wrapping up the study session. So we're together with our medical students and we're getting ready for rounds with Dr. Green tomorrow. And we're gonna start quizzing each other using our notes. All right, here we go. So Mrs. Jones's cancer was caused by, um, okay, so it's gonna be genetic and you can't catch a genetic disease, but you can inherit it from your parents. Okay, Dr. Green said the cancerous cells were in her cervix. What type of cancer could it be? Um, cervical cancer. Remember, it's named after the body part that it's in. What kind of treatment should we receive? That depends on the type of cancer and how advanced it is. Okay, rounds day two. Dr. Green has a question for you. Time to use your pre preparation. How would you diagnose Mrs. Jones? What caused it? Um, we suspect that she has cervical cancer that may be caused by environmental or genetic factors. Now, what's the next logical step? I think it would depend. Okay, and the next uh, question here. Um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Amri Kanani, Amri Ghani is doing promising research on cancer cells. He asked me earlier if he could have the samples we collected from Mrs. Jones for his research. What do you think we should do? Um, 
you should definitely ask the patient's permission first. And this is, if you um, follow the story of Henrietta Locks, that's like she came in with cervical cancer and um, they, they took her cells. Well, how would we have known this? But this is terrible. Your team heads to rounds so they can ask Mrs. Jones for permission. You see one of the nurses cleaning up the room and Dr. Green talks to her. He returns and says, unfortunately, Miss Jones passed away overnight. While she did have cancer, her unexpected death was caused by a blood clot. We could not have predicted. Before moving her to the room, he remembers, since we can't ask permission, should we share um, her cells? Please try again. Um, what do you think? Should we ask the family for permission? Or give, the, give him the cells? Or hold on to the cells and say no? Let's maybe see what the family has to say. Didn't leave any contact information. Shoot, now what should we do? Probably hold on to the cells. All right. Keeping the immortal cells. The team didn't share the samples, but held on to them. Mrs. Jones died suddenly of an unpredictable blood clot and has been moved to the morgue. For the moment, so she has no family contacts listed. This is so very sad. I know, I don't know if any of you guys have been affected by cancer, but um, I did have a... my. Former partner's mom died of cervical cancer, and so this is just, this is, touches a lot of people, you know? Um, okay. All right, but let's continue learning. Weeks later, you notice something about the samples. Mrs. Jones's cells are different than, from normal cells. Normal cells are usually replaced via mitosis, but the process slows down and stops. However, her cancerous cells kept dividing and dividing. They are essentially immortal. As long as they have nutrients, they will continue replicating. Oftentimes, cancer robs the other body parts around from nutrients, which is why um, they can cause those effects uh, more rapidly. These immortal cells could have been used for future research and make countless discoveries. Immortal cancer cells could have helped make several breakthrough discoveries, including the items listed to the right. Click on at least two to learn more and move on. Well, I am very interested in radiation. Um, Okay, we can learn more here. I'm gonna let you guys do your own research here. This is pretty interesting though. Um, these are like, like I said, the HeLa cells um, and all the different things that it's been used on. Ebola virus, salmonella, HIV, polio, sickle cell anemia, cancer treatments, how cells behave in outer space. They must have used HeLa cells too. But the ethics of samples, discoveries could have been made, but your team has made legal and ethical choice. Decisions like this are at the core of medical ethics, the principles that guide medical practices. One of the principles is called bodily autonomy. Bodily autonomy is the idea that everyone has complete control over their body. In fact, medical personnel are legally bound to get permission before any treatment, procedure, or test. Which of the following scenarios does bodily autonomy apply? In other words, which scenario needs permission first? Is it that a family member needs a pint of blood due to blood loss? A doctor wants to check your hormone levels? You are the only match for an organ donation for the Pope? Your blood contains the cure for a fatal disease. And all of those would be accurate. All right, so the real Mrs. Jones was Henrietta Locks. Okay, I was wondering if they were gonna get to this. Mrs. Jones is based on the experience of Henrietta Locks, a young African-American woman who sought treatment at Johns Hopkins University Hospital in the 1950s. Mrs. Locks was admitted with the exact symptoms that Mrs. Jones had in your case study and given the same diagnosis of cervical cancer. At the time, a cancer researcher at the hospital was seeking new cell lines. The ones they had kept dying out. In a blatant and tragic violation of medical ethics, the researcher gathered cells from every cancer patient in the hospital, including Mrs. Locks. Um, why was that an ethical violation? And again, um, put this in your own words, but remember that um, should have bodily autonomy to be able to contact the patient, the family, um, and and otherwise you don't have permission to use those cells. And you can pause it too to type that in, but 
Um, here's a fluorescent image of some of those HeLa cells. Um, and we just looked at some of the discoveries that they've saved, but you can go further into that. But did the ends justify the means? Ethical decisions like this are complex and difficult, so how do we make them? How do we move forward as ethically as possible? What actions would help foster ethical medical practices? Drop each item into the appropriate category. Okay, so make a decision before entering a conversation. Maybe not. Maybe you should talk to people first. Talk to medical experts only. Um, actually, if you listen to the talk with my sister, she t said they oftentimes use um, a religious standpoint, like a, a minister. Our uncle actually sat on the board for that. Um, and sometimes even like veterinary sciences. Finish the conversation with a locked decision. Um, again, maybe instead you could, after the path is decided, continue learning and reflect, giving some flexibility there. Imagining the consequences of each pa path, researching what has been done to the past, and then communicating with medical experts. All right, so. We're going to keep trucking along here, but it has been about 25 minutes. Like I said, I'd like to take a break at that point. Take a 10-minute break if you want to pause and come back, but we'll keep going here. True Stories of Ethical Dilemmas Part 3, and we end with a golden arm. When James Harrison was a child, he was in a severe accident. During the following surgery, he received 13 liters of donated blood. After Mr. Harrison recovered, he vowed to donate blood like those who did for him. Researchers found that his blood contained a special antibody that could be a treatment for rhesus disease, a disease which affects um, infants and results in death. The medical team informed Mr. Harrison of the discovery and its potential use. They asked permission to use more blood, and Mr. Harrison said yes to more donations. In 2018, he made his 1,173rd donation and saved over 2.4 million babies. What aspect of the story were about bodily autonomy? Um, it, his blood had a rare antibody, and because of that, the doctors wanted to use his blood for treatment. Here is another. Um, oh wait, another question about it. Same disease. How did the doctors treat the bodily autonomy correctly? Um, they requested his permission. And maybe also they explained how his blood would help. That's probably important. All right, so. Oh, this is all very interesting. Okay, so we have Ebola survivors. Ebola is an extremely virulent virus that is found in Africa. It's responsible for approximately 11,000 deaths a year. Research has found that survivors could harbor antibodies for the virus. These antibodies could be used to develop an immunization, as, or a vaccine, for example. As a researcher, how would you approach the survivors? Um, go through the medical records and pull any samples without permission. Probably shouldn't do that. Ignore the patient and keep... Okay, nope. Continue with the transplant. So you're going to want to contact the survivors. Contact the doctor who treated the survivors. Ask her to reach out and give them um, your contact information so that they wanted to reach out, they could. All right, end of life. A patient has been undergoing treatment for an aggressive form of brain cancer. In spite of the best efforts by the medical team, he is going to die soon. His primary physician is pushing for the patient to remain in the hospital and stay in treatment because it could add months to his life. The patient, however, does not want to stay in the hospital. He wants to go home and enjoy his final weeks with his family. As the doctor, what would you do? Seems like a nice thing. Allow the patient to go home. I would not do that one. Don't diet. Let the lecture on why he needs to follow the diet plan. I mean, that might be cool to emphasize. 
And you can't just give someone a treatment without unrestraining them. All right, last one. You are treating a patient who has been waiting for a liver transplant for three years. He has been given a strict diet and must follow it, both to stay healthy and to ensure that he will not damage his new liver. You discover that has not been following the diet plan. A liver donor has been found, but you're not sure what you should schedule the, if you should schedule the transplant surgery. What would you do? Um, don't perform the surgery. And tell him you'll have to follow the diet plan. Cool. All right, some more ethical scenarios. Um, and this time we'll design our own ethical solution. A candidate for elective office comes to you for treatment and you discover that she has a disease that will impact her ability to perform her duties. Um, so we get to select one more select. So select which one you think you are going to do. And let's maybe stick with our, our space mission with the astronaut. This lesson's feeling a little random, but let's bring it back in. What should be done? You're on a flight surgeon at NASA when several responsible for the health of astronauts. One of the astronauts that you've developed a friendly relationship has finally received the call for his life. You'll be part of the first mission to Mars. Woohoo! Unfortunately, during your medical review, you find that he has some genetic markers for Huntington's disease, which affects motor control and thinking ability. While he has no visible symptoms, you know that the disease could appear at any time or even not at all. Do you risk the safety of the mission or do you risk taking away a colleague's lifelong dream? What would you do? So write down what you think. Kind of an interesting connection is um, I just learned that the Apollo 13 mission tried to go to the moon um, days before, like a week before they went up, one of the astronauts had measles and so they had to completely change the crew. So not unlikely that that would happen. Conclusion. First, do no harm. Medical ethics is a large and challenging field with situations that don't have easy answers. Medical practitioners and researchers hold a lot of power, and it's a challenge to wield it ethically. They are not alone in making these ethical decisions, but government representatives, ethics experts, and civilians all contribute a voice. The principles that guide medical practice help doctors and researchers ethically treat patients. Medical ethics experts ethics has evolved over the years and will continue to do so. All right, and that's the end of that lesson. Um, I'm going to go ahead and link the conversation with Dr. Don Lammert because I think that ties in really well with this lesson. I don't know why this one was like kind of random on here, but pretty cool um, to learn about medical ethics. How many of you want to go into the medical field? I'm curious. Um, let me know. Make sure to schedule your DBAs for this week. Uh, your first one should for sure be done. Um, and yeah, and then we'll just go on and we'll do the other, other lessons here coming up. Okay. Bye-bye.